Shelby, I'm back up. Do you guys need anything from me? No, we're good. We'll just wait until 12.05. Uh, okay. Looks like we've got some folks joining us.
Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dr. Christina Wickman. I will be presenting on perinatal anxiety during the COVID pandemic. We will be starting in just a few moments. So we're going to give everybody just another minute or two to enter. Um, and that will get started in just a moment or two. Thank you for your attendance. All right, I am nothing if not prompt. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, again, my name is Dr. Christina Wickman. I'm the medical director of the Periscope Project. I wanna welcome everybody to our uh, webinar today. Well, I'm going to be speaking on perinatal anxiety uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, if you haven't already, please go ahead and mute yourself. Um, you can certainly choose to keep your video on or off. Um, I'll be frank, I like it when a couple of people leave the video on so I can take a peek at them and, and watch them for cues while I'm talking rather than just talking to my empty office all by myself. So I appreciate that. Um, the questions can be typed into the chat box really at any point during the presentation. Uh, Shelby Keen, um, who is our program director and administrator, will be monitoring that chat box and um, Answer those if I see those pop up or she'll interrupt me so I can answer them along the way. And hopefully we'll have some time at the end so I could answer questions at the end as well. Um, thank you for joining us. I, I appreciate you taking time out of your day so you can learn a little bit about this topic and hopefully it will be helpful for you and the patients that you're serving. Great. So let's go ahead and get started again. Um, this, is, uh, this is what we're talking about today. Um, it's being hosted by the Periscope Project. Again, I'm um, the medical director of that program. Let's just take a few minutes um, to introduce our team. I've mentioned Shelby Keen already. Um, she's our program administrator. Um, Melissa Hayes is our program triage. Um, so she'll be the voice uh, along with Shelby doing some coverage of the Periscope project if you were to um, call our 1-800 number. Um, so Shelby and Melissa give a wave, say hi. Um, and then I'm going to keep on going so you can see everybody. So the objectives of this talk today uh, are listed here. I'll go ahead and move down a little bit just so I can see best. Um, so I, I want to talk a little bit about how this pandemic will be maybe affecting perinatal women in particular. Um, I'm going to take some time to describe intrusive thoughts related to an anxiety disorder and compare those to the intrusive uh, to intrusive thoughts. Um, that we can see at other points um, during the woman's life. I'm going to talk about some non-pharmacologic treatment options for perinatal anxiety, as well as some pharmacologic options. Um, not going into too much uh, detail, but really covering um, some of the some more specific and general medication classes that we utilize, such as the SSRIs and, and benzodiazepines, and what those um, risks are to a fetus as well as to a breastfeeding infant. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about how Periscope can be there to support you in your practice, um, both during this time as well as. All right, so let's start with this case study. Um, so this is an actual case that happened relatively early in our uh, pandemic, um, where our maternal fetal medicine physician contacted the Periscope project. She had a patient in her office who was 26 weeks pregnant. Um, she had gestational diabetes as one of her complications struggling with in, uh, insomnia, both um, falling asleep as well as staying asleep, so uh, initial and middle insomnia. Patient had a history of attention deficit disorder, um, and she was um, actually currently taking Adderall 
um, throughout her pregnancy and had maintained that um, secondary to in a really inability to function given the severity of her ADD. Um, so she continued that throughout her pregnancy and she was also taking Zolpidem or Ambien um, fairly consistently again throughout her pregnancy as well. And so those are the two medications that she had been on pre-pregnancy and had um, continued them with um, some um, consistent th see throughout her pregnancy thus far. Um, and the provider called and, and said that the patient was quote unquote obsessing uh, over COVID-19. I'm really kind of focused on that, lots of intrusive thoughts and were really spiraling anxiety specific around COVID. Was calling the clinic on a very uh, consistent basis, asking about masks, uh, asking about the number of ventilators that the hospital had, asking about procedures that would take place. Um, during the delivery process. Um, and clearly she was um, making the people in the clinic quite anxious as well. So, um, so called and tried to see if, how, how we could help um, navigate some of this anxiety um, that this patient was experiencing. So we gave her a call back, um, given kind of the specificity uh, around anxiety uh, related to COVID, um, we talked about a therapy referral and that had already been placed. Um, so that was great to give her how specific her anxiety symptoms were. Um, we also talked about how her current dose of the uh, amphetamine and dextroamphetamine, the Adderall, may actually be exacerbating her anxiety symptoms. Um, so as most of you are aware, a lot of us may be working in very different environments. And so um, this was a woman who was you now trying to work from home, and, but not working to as much as she had been previously. And so with that in mind, I wondered if her Adderall was actually worsening her anxiety symptoms and she, she actually needed that high of a dose given kind of where at this point. And so we, I recommended to her decreasing the dose of, of her Adderall to see if that would help with her, some of her anxiety symptoms. And we also talked about minimizing her use of Zolpidem. So that's um, not necessarily specific to her anxiety, um, but more just good, good general practice for minimizing of sleep aids with pregnancy and trying to minimize to typically no more than three times per week. Um, given that this was a relatively um, quick onset, she'd only been experiencing these symptoms for the last one to two weeks, um, it didn't feel strongly that we needed to start uh, another medication or a daily medication at this point. It certainly wanted to kind of keep an eye on these symptoms um, and considered um, an SSRI to target her anxiety um, if her anxiety persisted and if it didn't get better with the, the um, recommendations that we had already tried to put in place, i.e. Um, decreasing her Adderall as well as the plan, as well as engagement in psychotherapy. Um, and so with that as a potential plan, I did talk about the risks of SSRI use late in pregnancy as well. All right. So, Let's talk a little bit about this increased stress. And notice I utilize the word stress and not anxiety during pregnant, uh, during um, anxiety during this pandemic, because everybody reacts to stress very differently. Um, some people have worse um, sleeping patterns. Some people sleep all the time. There could be changes in eating, more difficulty with um, sleeping, um, concentrating, uh, attention, focus at work. Um, there might be more and more rumination about their own health issues, particularly if they're felt that COVID, if they were to contract that, could worsen their own chronic health issues, um, as well as um, worsening of uh, underlying mental health disorders. Unfortunately, we can also see increased use of alcohol, drugs, um, tobacco during times of increased stress as well. We also hear a lot about grief. And so, sep se um, separate from distress and anxiety, a lot of people talk about loss um, and, and grief is a really natural response to loss. Um, and there's a couple of different losses that we can talk about. One is primary loss, so certainly loss of a, a loved one or major life changes. And that's certainly something that all of us have really experienced is the, the major life changes that all of us have experienced in the last um, couple of months. Secondary loss is uh, more of a perceived loss. Um, so this per perceived loss of freedom, companionship, support, um, this, this um, piece that we are kind of very isolated. And so um, is that a loss of the supports that you had that were in person, but you no longer can have that. Um, and then this concept of anticipatory loss. So simply the unknown, how long will this be ongoing for? 
this point, who knows, you know, if we had asked that question back in early March, man, I really would have hoped that things had been normalized by June, but yet here we are, and I'm clearly in my home office here in this webinar at this point. Um, so things are very different at this point, and we have no idea as to when that normalcy will return. So what does grief look like? Um, so grief from an emotional standpoint, um, a lot of different uh, emotional type symptoms, so disbelief, avoidance, um, difficulty with acceptance. It can come out as irritability, anger, um, sadness, tearfulness, fear, um, even more social withdrawal. So not just physical social distancing, but more social withdrawal um, with how you could interact with folks, as well as this feeling of uh, disconnectedness. Physically, grief can um, come out in multiple different ways. Fatigue, stomach upset, difficulty breathing, shifts in weight, secondary to appetite changes, again, changes with sleep, restlessness. Um, um, it'd probably be hard for us to find a lot of people right now that haven't experienced some of these symptoms in the last three months. Again, not necessarily saying that they're struggling with a mental health disorder per se, but again, the symptoms of how we are managing and coping with these stressors and the grief secondary to the losses that we have experienced. So it's really okay to remind patients that this is normal, um, that what we're experiencing uh, from a grief standpoint is, is really normal and that grief can comes in, comes in waves. It can affect all of us very differently. Um, and when that wave of grief does come, it's okay to connect with that, to acknowledge it, to reflect on it, um, and to, to own it, that it's there and that it's sad. Um, and it may come um, days or weeks after that, that primary loss. Um, so while we're talking about pregnancy and part postpartum women, again, a lot of this can affect any of us. I'm gonna pick on my poor children at this point. Um, my, my 13 year old son, uh, qualified for the nap for a national the national swim meet and unfortunately that was canceled um, and it was weeks later that he finally kind of opened up about how that affected him standpoint and losing that and we're hearing a lot from our pregnant women and our postpartum women that they are losing what their expectations of of their pregnancies that they're losing what they had the mentality of, of what their postpartum experience was going, supposed to be like, right? So they were supposed to have their mom with them. They're supposed to have supports at the hospital. Mom was maybe supposed to move in or maybe in-laws and help support them um, throughout that, that um, period of time. And, and now that's really changing um, and that may not be able to happen. And that's, that's okay to remind patients that it's okay to do that. But when do we kind of transition? When does anxiety, symptoms, and grief, and the feelings of loss, how do, when does that become clinically significant? How does this morph from what's quote unquote normal, given what's going on in the world right now, and given that normal stressors, when does that become clinically significant? Let's talk a little bit about um, different types of perinatal psychiatric disorders. Um, the first of which, baby blues, is not a psychiatric disorder. That is, a, again, a normal phenomenon that can happen um, and happens with the vast majority of postpartum women. Affects about 80% of our postpartum mamas um, and is very self-limited. Um, so I tell my moms that after you deliver a baby, you are allowed to be a hot mess for the first two weeks after you give birth to a baby. You're allowed to be tearful. You're going to have sleep changes. You're going to be irritable. You've probably had a prolonged period of being awake. Um, you're probably um, having some pain. You're having sleep deprivation. And you've had this massive hormone crash. And so all of that can come out with lots of different emotional symptoms. However, that's different from a perinatal depression or a perinatal anxiety disorder. So a depression is going to kind of meet the same criteria as we would at any other in somebody's life. Um, from a major depressive disorder or major depressive episode. So you're looking for at least two weeks of depressive symptoms. And the key here, and the key to that question that we had up on the screen one slide before, was the um, effect, ability to affect functioning. So that's really the key, is that if depressive symptoms or anxiety symptoms are affecting that patient's ability to function, to care for themselves, to care for their baby, to care for their family, to go to work, 
to function in that same capacity that they did before, and that's prolonged, so typically we're looking at two weeks or longer, that is where that threshold is, is going to um, be reached, that, um, that those symptoms are no longer just symptoms and are meeting diagnostic criteria, that we need to do something, something to, to help improve them. Depression, of course, we're going to be thinking more depressed mood, lack of interest, excessive worry, um, certainly thoughts of, of self-harm or passive death wish, where anxiety tends to be much more focused on excessive worrying, restlessness, inability to relax, panic symptoms. So given that we're talking about perinatal anxiety, I want to go into that a little bit more um, in detail. Perinatal anxiety has not gotten the traction that perinatal depression has over the last decade or so. So we hear a lot about postpartum depression, um, and there's a lot more traction to be screening moms for depression symptoms, um, both during pregnancy and after. We, we haven't quite caught up with perinatal anxiety, which is unfortunate because it's just as common as perinatal depression. So that's really something to keep in mind. That when you're screening your patients for depressive symptoms, you really need to be looking um, for anxiety symptoms as well. And some of our screening tools may or may not have that built into that. So that's something that you need to be mindful of. Again, symptoms tend to be more about inability to kind of relax, settle down, persistent worry, physiological arousal, as well as the concept of intrusive thoughts. And so I'll spend a, a bit of time on intrusive thoughts because they are fairly specific to our perinatal population. Certainly they can occur with any patient, um, but it seems to be very ramped up, particularly in our postpartum moms. Intrusive thoughts, particularly um, thoughts of harm coming to an infant are incredibly common in women who have anxiety disorders. The key to this is, is that they absolutely have no intention of harming that infant, and they'll often they'll go to great strides to avoid having those thoughts. And for most moms, that means avoiding the infant. Again, these, these thoughts are incredibly distressing to them, but they have insight into how distressing they are. And so they're trying to distance them themselves from their children to be able to avoid having those thoughts. Certainly you need to differentiate that from psychotic symptoms of thoughts of harm, um, but typically that's not going to present in an outpatient setting. And those women who are, are having psychotic symptoms don't have the rational thought that these true that these thoughts are distressing. Women with anxiety disorders are distressed by these thoughts. They're oftentimes very hesitant to share these thoughts because it sounds terrible if you say, I've had thoughts about putting my baby in the microwave, or I've had thoughts about stabbing my baby with a kitchen knife. And that sounds terrible. And so they're very fearful of having child protective services involvement. And so really over the course of my career, um, giving those spe specific examples like I just shared with you is really necessary um, for women to be comfortable in sharing their specific thoughts with you. And so asking about these kinds of thoughts is really helpful. Relating this back to COVID, a lot of the intrusive thoughts that I'm seeing right now are surrounding contamination, sickness, germs, um, and really kind of taking some of the um, safety precautions that the CDC and other organizations are telling us to do kind of to an nth degree. Um, you know, washing their hands until they're cracked and bleeding. I had one woman just yesterday in my clinic that her hands were just raw because she's washing so often because she's so fearful of her baby having COVID, getting COVID from her. Wiping down things over and over obsessively and cleaning. Um, even to the point where wipe, wiping babies um, with bleach wipes um, to protect them. Again, they mean no harm by them. They're trying to protect their children. So asking these specific questions as it relates to illness and COVID may be very beneficial to you as well. What about OCD? So OCD is something, uh, again, that a lot of women may come into a pregnancy and postpartum um, period with. Um, they may develop um, obsessive compulsive disorder where those obsessive intrusive, where those intrusive thoughts then are tagged with a compulsion. So they have the intrusive thought and then they have to have a compulsion tagged with it in order to neutralize that thought. So kind of the most um, common one that we think about and one that's uh, again popping up a lot today around sickness and germs is, is decontamination. So a woman is fearful that her baby is going to get sick. So in order to neutralize that thought, she engages in hand washing and it just becomes this vicious cycle. 
Um, Post-traumatic stress disorder, um, again, unfortunately very common in women, um, about uh, a, a significant amount of women, up to 15%, may be suffering from PTSD, and that may be secondary to something that happened prior to pregnancy, such as a, a sexual trauma, or it may be the tra a traumatic birth experience. And we, we've talked about this a lot in the past, but this is something that, with this pandemic, um, really is the risk of, um, to a woman to experience her birth process as traumatic. Certainly, the anxiety prior to labor about going into a hospital setting, having potential exposure to COVID and what that's going to look like. Um, if they happen to have a, they're planning to give birth at a place that's not allowing birth partners. So there are certainly some hospitals across the country that are not allowing birth partners um, and they're giving birth alone. Um, that perceived lack of support, again, feeling disconnected, feeling helpless. How 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 does that how is that perceived? Again, it's not the reality of what the the harm that was going to come. That that you how you diagnose PTSD. It's how that was perceived by the patient. If it was perceived as traumatic. Um, so as much as we can do to really inform our patients about what that birth experience is going to look like and give them as much control as possible within the expectations that we can is, is going to be incredibly helpful. What are some factors that are going to be associated with increased risk of all of these disorders? Um, so certainly lack of social support, there's marital discord with a partner. If a woman has a pregnancy that is less than one year, um, after her, her last pregnancy, that's a very high risk for development of a maternal mental health disorder. Our teenage moms are at a very high risk, about one in four teenage moms will develop a mental health disorder. Um, and during the pandemic, really the, the thought among all of us who practice in this field is that there's this concern that now really all women are at an increased risk for, for mental health conditions. And certainly those with uh, pre-existing mental health conditions are at risk for having exacerbation given this feeling of, of, of social isolation. So you know, three months ago, one of my biggest things that I would tell my postpartum moms was, I need you to, to get up, get dressed, have structure to the day and get out of the house and interact with people on a very regular basis. I almost, I typically would say, I want you out of the house at least every day. So I can't do that anymore. So without that social connectedness and that feeling of isolation, we have to be, thoughtful about how women can still connect and have social engagement and still have protections in place um, from, a, from a COVID protection standpoint. Uh, it is so vitally important that we continue to do screening. Um, so I had mentioned screening earlier. So the EPDS is specific to our pregnant and postpartum population. The nice thing about the EPDS is that it does have an anxiety subscale really built into it. So if you look at the EPDS, questions three, four, and five are specific to anxiety. So even if you're not doing a specific anxiety screening tool, look at those three questions of the EPDS if that you're using it, because that'll help kind of clue into some of these anxiety symptoms. The PHQ-9 is specific to depression. Um, and so a lot of institutions are utilizing the PHQ-9. Again, if that's the only questionnaire that you're utilizing, please ask some follow-up questions specific to anxiety. Um, while a lot of the medical community is moving towards virtual visits, we need to be mindful of how the processes that we are doing our screening are still in place. So a lot of clinics may have the front desk staff or MA have that patient complete their screening tool in person when they check in. If that's not happening, how are these screenings happening? And so ask your, you know, ask your clinic staff, ask you, um, be, be mindful yourself. Um, I've heard of some clinics having the nurse or MA call the patient before their scheduled appointment time with the doc and doing the screen over the phone um, and then having those results available for the physician. Um, I've heard of other clinics doing that the physician's doing the clinic screening. I've heard of other clinics utilizing their EMR or pushing out an email to have the patient complete the screen ahead of time and send it back in. So there's lots of different ways that we can be creative, but ensuring that we're still doing formalized screening with validated screen tools is, is vitally important during this time. And then obviously following up. So particularly if that screen is being done by somebody other than the provider that that patient is going to connect with, 
So if the MA or the nurse or it's being done online, please take the time to review that screening tool with that patient. So patients uh, will always tell us that, you know, I took the time to complete it, even if it was quote unquote normal, I want to know about it, let me know. Um, and if there's specific um, questions that are elevated, but maybe the total score is still below the cutoff, asking about those specific questions. Again, the subscale of questions three, four, five, perhaps asking about sleep. If you're looking for a good open-ended question, how is this transition to motherhood meeting your expectations, particularly in the time of a worldwide pandemic? How is this meeting your expectations? How can I help support you, given that things are not what we anticipated they would be? Um, I'm gonna go through some non-pharmacologic treatment options. Um, and there's listed here. Um, so some of these, are, these are all options um, evidence-based specific to the perinatal period. So that's the caveat here is that these are things that are specific to perinatal bleeding. Um, so psychotherapy, light box, or, or bright therapy. Um, we'll talk about a couple of CAM options, sleep and self-care. Um, so looking at CAM options, um, again, specific to the perinatal population, there's a really excellent solid evidence base of exercise. And so I, I know that you know, a lot of women, now that the um, weather's turning a little bit and they get a little warmer consistently, I'm encouraging everybody to get out to walk, um, to um, have some type of exercise 30 minutes a day or, or on most days, because there's great evidence that that's going to be helpful for depression. Massage, um, whether it's partner massage or actually from a massage therapist, um, relaxation, meditation. There's lots of apps right now um, that still are free um, throughout our community, uh, throughout um, this pandemic. So Calm app, Headspace, um, those kinds of things can be really um, useful. Um, Omega-3 fatty acid supplementation um, does have some decent evidence uh, and specific to, to pregnant populations and look, looked at in this population and, and folate supplementation as well. Some inconclusive evidence, again, specific to this population, St. John's Wort and SAMI have not had any studies um, regarding safety during pregnancy in order to recommend it. Acupuncture, the evidence is really divided. So if we've got a patient who really is, um, feel strongly about um, acupuncture use in pregnancy, or acupuncture use in pregnancy, that, that's helpful for her mental health. I certainly support that, um, but I don't have any specific guidance to recommend if that's going to be helpful. I think it's really important to emphasize sleep hygiene um, as much as we can during pregnancy, but certainly in that postpartum period. Um, I really, I spend a lot of time talking with partners and their and patients about how to split night shifts, um, particularly if a woman identifies herself as somebody who quote unquote needs her sleep. Um, she's got a breastfeeding baby and she's up you know, every 90 to three minutes to two hours all night long over and over again. That's certainly going to impact her ability to cope with stress and anxiety as well. Um, so kind of thinking about um, sleep hygiene and sleep in, um, well before delivery can be helpful. Things that we all should be doing, um, just good catch self-care. If a mom's breastfeeding, we should be encouraging her to get an additional, additional calories. Um, typically about 500 additional calories is what we recommend. Um, I have her think about eating or drinking some time, every time that the infant is feeding. So if she's sitting down to feed the baby, she should be, she should be sitting down to feed herself. So is that, it is something easy that she can have yogurt, cheese sticks, granola bars, whatever the case may be, a bottle of water that she has with her. Um, once cleared to exercise, again, we talked about that evidence based with exercise she should be doing so, and then involve the baby as much as, as she wants to, um, and certainly avoidance of, of other substances that may impact mood, um, alcohol, tobacco, other substances. Um, I have been very much emphasizing to my pregnant and postpartum women that social distancing does not mean social isolation. I'm sure, certain that most of you have heard that phrase as well. And so encouraging um, our moms to utilize technology to communicate, take this time to reconnect with friends and family, connect with other moms, um, whether it's on Facebook or virtual supports or peer-to-peer -peer support groups. So two of them are listed here. Um, in, in Wisconsin, the Madison area partners, parent support and MMHI. Um, so really um, encouraging that piece is, is going to be helpful. Um, other things um, really um, structured 
tools and tips to talk to your patients about um, is limiting news media um, and choosing reliable news sources. Uh, I think that's just helpful to re-emphasize that. Um, finding the things in their life that they do have a, that sense of control. Um, so as much as you can do as their medical provider to involve um, patients in the decisions, um, some of them may some of that may be very limited, um, especially with um, clinic appointments or um, that birthing process. There just may not be as many options as we once had because of the restrictions that we do. Encourage patients to learn about and inform them about their that delivery process. Uh, have them engage with their daycare policies if they're planning on sending their child to daycare because that is ever evolving as well. Um, and, and how they're going to get support um, face to face. Um, and then resources for anxiety management too. Um, so that, again, I listed a couple of these earlier. Headspace, 10% happier, COVID coach. Um, those are all anxiety uh, resources for anxiety management as well. Dr. Wickham, we have a question in the inbox for you. Sure. Okay. Any experience with the use of amino acid for anxiety in pregnancy in non-pregnant women with good success due to mechanism for increased GABA neurotransmitter support, but do not have experience or knowledge about its use in pregnancy or lactation? So that's a great question, and um, I just actually attended a, a, a lecture earlier this week about uh, CAM um, alternative um, utilization of supplements um, with treatment of depression and anxiety. And unfortunately, I think you're spot on is that we do not have that um, evidence base in pregnancy or in lactation. Um, I think mechanistically, it doesn't. I think it it would be appropriate, kind of what we what we know about that, but we don't have any specific knowledge to the perinatal population. Um, so other things that we can specifically um, do to to talk with our patients or to encourage our patients about how to kind of manage um, distress, that, that grief and anxiety. Structure of routine is really helpful. Um, I mentioned earlier, you know. Three months ago, I tell my patients, you gotta have structure during your during your maternity leave. You gotta get up, you gotta shower, you have to have a routine, you gotta get outside. Um, and all of that continues to be um, really helpful. Um, so and, and as much as you can to encourage them to have maintenance of a daily routine that involves their kiddo, that they have um, some kind of routine that they can structure throughout their day and throughout their week. Um, that, that should include some time outside if able, as well as physical. Encouraging patients to ask for help. Um, this is something that I've always said. So if, if some if, if a family member or friend offers you help, then the question, then the answer should be yes. Um, and it may not be as easy for people to come in and help and do the laundry and sweep the floor or run um, hold their hold the baby while you take a shower. So we need to be a little bit more creative of how to do that. So is that meal drop offs is, you know, can somebody drop off a meal at the front door without having without coming in? Is that asking somebody to run errands on your behalf? Is that talking to your partner or other family about child duty? I've had lots of um, families in this postpartum period that have chosen to quarantine together. Um, so two families quarantining together to be able to support each other. So if it's, it's in-laws and uh, parents with a new baby, or a, a sister and sister-in-law, or a sister and brother-in-law with with their children, as well as a, a mom and dad with a new baby, so that they can support, provide support to each other. Um, so that's something that I've heard as well, um, and, and certainly to talk to their doctor if their symptoms don't improve, particularly if they are struggling from a functioning standpoint and they're having difficulty um, caring for themselves and, and functioning caring for their baby. Um, Things that you can do, um, so particularly if you're working in a clinic setting or a virtual setting. Um, so I haven't seen a patient face to face in over three months at this point. And so everything is being done from my computer at this point. So as much as you can to do direct eye contact with the patient. And that oftentimes means looking at that little green dot at the top where my camera is and not at the patient's face down at the screen. So little things that if you're doing virtual visits to be mindful of, of how you can engage with that camera. Um, to be able to engage with that patient. Um, if you're wearing a photo ID, you know, a photo ID with your with your smiling face, particularly if you're masked. We've seen lots of interesting things about 
putting a picture of what their what their face looks like next to them, um, right up on their shoulders, so that when they're masked with their eye with their glasses and their full PPE on, they can still see who they're engaging with. Again, as much as you can do to walk your patients through about what the changes are in place through the pandemic, that can be really helpful. And helping identify patients with backup plans. What if their partner gets COVID um, and they're not allowed in the hospital? What if their plan for daycare falls through or their nanny at a coworker right now whose nanny is COVID positive? So how does that, you know, what are your backup plans for that kind of piece? Um, Encourage them that delivering in a hospital or birth center still remains the safest place for delivery rather than a home birth. Um, those, those kinds of pieces can still be really um, important and things that you can encourage your patients with. In the transition to psychopharmacology, and I'm going to talk about again um, most common medications. Um, and so, kind of opening it up to, to when is it time to consider medication as a treatment option for anxiety symptoms? And so, again, Keeping this question in mind, I really want you to think about patients and from a functioning standpoint and if, um, how much is it affecting their ability to function day in, day out. Um, so if the answer is yes, and it's been a couple of weeks and she's really struggling, it may be time to not only consider all of the non-pharmacologic options, including therapy, but also medication management. The most commonly utilized class of medications for anxiety and depression, even in, in the pregnant um, population, the best studied are the SSRIs. Um, so in the green box, those are listed uh, there. The caveat is for, for fluvoxamine or Luvox, which is primarily utilized um, as an agent for obsessive compulsive disorder. The vast majority of these medications have been incredibly well studied, um, with literally hundreds of studies at this point that they're used in pregnancy. We like them because they're easy to use and dose. Um, they have um, a high therapeutic index um, and they're relatively well tolerated by the vast majority of patients, including pregnant women. Generally, things that we think about from a risk standpoint, um, so there's always concern about poor pregnancy outcomes. So things like birth weight, um, birth length, APGAR scores, gestational age, and very consistently, meta-analyses of, of these studies have failed to find any statistically significant or clinically relevant differences between groups exposed versus not exposed to SSRIs in pregnancy. There, does, um, there is some inconsistent literature about an increased risk of spontaneous abortion or miscarriage in that first trimester of pregnancy. Um, we also know that women who have untreated, both untreated at moderate to, to severe um, depression and anxiety, also have a higher risk of miscarriage as well. So that was a little bit gray as to um, cause and effect with that piece. By far and away, the most common complication of SSRI use in pregnancy is that of a poor neonatal adaptation, which can lead to an increased risk of ICU or NICU admission. So poor neonatal adaptation or quote unquote withdrawal, serotonergic withdrawal can occur in about 30% uh, of late pregnancy exposed infants. So infants consistently exposed after 20 weeks of gestation. Um, again, by far and away the most common side effect that we see. This can occur with any antidepressant at any dose. Um, and this is, so it's not a reason to taper down the dose of an SSRI in the third trimester or in the weeks leading up to delivery. Because if you've chosen to keep a woman on an antidepressant in pregnancy, my assumption is that you've done the risk benefit analysis that the, the risks of her having a psychiatric decompensation um, outweigh the risks of this medication. And so by taking her off that medication, what we're doing is really just setting her up um, for a, uh, a relapse in that really high relapse time of, of postpartum. Um, what this looks like is that babies may not feed as well. They may not sleep as well. Um, they may be more irritable. Um, may, a few may experience some seizure-like activity. Um, we just provide symptomatic care. We swaddle them up tight, skin to skin contact, small frequent feedings. We just get these babies through that period of time. Congenital abnormalities have also been really well studied um, with first trimester exposure of SSRIs in pregnancy. But you need to know that if you look at the best done data, so prospective controlled studies and the meta analyses of those studies, 
there has not been shown to be an increased risk of congenital abnormalities with SSRI use in pregnancy. Some of the retrospective case controlled studies, so this is older data, have demonstrated an increased risk of some very rare disorders. Um, but even if, so if it's a very rare disorder, something like anencephaly, even if we multiply it by two or three, it's still a very rare disorder. So we need to make sure that we're putting that in terms of absolute risk for an individual patient. Because Dr. Google is not my friend, I go over this and I talk about the differences between prospective and retrospective data. And I talk about the risk of cardiac defects in particular, because that's the one that oftentimes comes up the most. So if you look at the worst, the worst data, um, meaning the highest risk, the risk of cardiac defects was about 1.5 with the general population being 1%. And again, that data has not been seen with prospective controlled studies, only in the retrospective data that's released. So it's important to put it in terms of absolute risk, as well as to go over really the, the broadness of the data with patients, because I find that if I don't do that, inevitably if they go to Dr. Google, then they'll give me a call back and say, you didn't tell me about cardiac defects. Tell, wait a minute, tell me about this. And so if I kind of preempted and explained the differences in data, that's really helpful. Other concerns that have been studied with SSRI use in pregnancy, um, persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn. So when that fetal circulatory system doesn't click over when of delivery, when that baby takes that first big breath. Um, this was um, initially reported in the early 2000s. Um, however, um, several studies have been done since then and because of that, the newest data and the better done data, the FDA has actually revised their warning saying that they actually can't make any conclusions based on the evidence. The older data um, did not control for known risk factors of PPHN. Those are listed here. They also are also, they're also risk factors for women who have depression or anxiety. So women who are struggling with depression, anxiety also have higher rates of smoking, obesity, prematurity, and C-section. So it became a little bit of a chicken and the egg um, of which caused which. Um, so the, the better done cohort studies, prospective cohort studies, have either not seen this um, correlation or they've seen it at much lower rates than what is the initial studies were showing. Postpartum hemorrhage, um, we know that serotonergic agent can affect, affect platelet aggregation and therefore can increase the risk of bleeding. There have been lots and lots of studies that have looked at this relationship. Um, the most recent study, and was actually quite interesting, was a cohort study where they compared serotonergic medication exposure to non-serotonergic um, psychiatric medication exposure to no psychiatric medication exposure. And they saw that both psychiatric medication groups had an increased risk of above baseline for bleeding, which leads us to wonder, is it more than just the serotonin piece? And are there other factors playing a role? So the jury's still a little bit out on this one. Um, this hasn't affected um, clinical practice at this point. So this is not something where we're encouraging um, providers or women to discontinue medications um, secondary to this risk of bleeding because we know that the risk of mental health disorders and risk of relapse and recurrence is much, much higher than the risk of From a neural developmental outcome standpoint, there have been lots of studies looking at this, so exposure of SSRIs in pregnancy, following these children up postpartum to one to three to five years of age. And really, the current thought is that exposure to untreated, particularly untreated severe maternal depression and anxiety in utero, as well as during early childhood, is associated with much worse cognitive and behavioral outcomes than antidepressant exposure. Um, so if you're going to utilize antidepressant medications, we want to treat them to remission, and those babies tend to fare better from neurodevelopmental outcomes than babies whose moms have untreated maternal um, health issues. I give a shout out to autism spectrum disorder because it seems like over the last decade or so, there's been lots of things implicated in the increased ri increasing risk of ASD. Um, this is controversial at best, um, and the initial studies failed to take um, into account several confounding factors, the number one of which was maternal psychiatric disorder itself. So we know that moms who have a psychiatric disorder already have a higher risk of having a child with ASD. And so without taking that into account, it's hard to kind of tease out this data. 
There have been several studies that have now looked at this relationship. The best done studies are um, sibling studies. So where a mother has two children, one exposed to an SSRI and one not exposed to an SSRI and comparing those two children from an ASD standpoint. And if you limit it to that sibling, those sibling studies, that relative risk goes away. So we're not seeing a relationship in, in that case. Mirtazapine or Remeron um, is a medication that is oftentimes utilized when women have a pretty terrible GI stress or hyperemesis. Um, if they are, particularly if they're unable to tolerate the GI distress that can come along with uh, any of the SSRIs. Um, so that's something to, to be mindful of. Um, really the studies that we have with mirtazapine at this point have been limited to looking at major malformations. And so we're not seeing a clear signal with, uh, with um, first trimester exposure increasing the um, major malformation risk. Again, the nice thing about bortezapine is that it is an anti-nausea medication. It's, it actually works quite well in patients with hyperemesis. Um, obviously, if it's increasing appetite, it can cause weight gain. And so if it's a lot of weight gain, obviously it can cause some obstetric complications. And the sedation, which may be helpful in pregnancy if women are struggling to sleep and have a lot of anxiety and, and are having sleep difficulties, obviously may be less tolerable in the po postpartum period when they're trying to care for babies overnight. Benzodiazepines are often utilized um, to target anxiety symptoms and can be utilized as a bridge um, for short-term use while an SSRI is being initiated. Initial reports demonstrated an increased risk of cleft lip and cleft palate with benzodiazepine use in pregnancy. Um, so similar to what I talked about, uh, the, the worst of the worst data with the SSRIs, this is similar. So the worst data suggests a rate of about 0 0.7 percent. But even that's not been confirmed by more recent studies of benzodiazepine exposure in first trimester. Um, there's, there's a UK primary care database um, that is listed here um, that found that the rate of major malformations was 2.7%. And that's in the range of what we typically quote for the general population. So general population, depending on how inclusive we're being with major and minor malformations, is typically between one and three um, percent. If, if women are using benzodiazepines on a daily, constant chronic basis, obviously we have some concern for toxicity and uh, physiologic dependence, which then can result in, in withdrawal for infant at time of delivery. So that is not something we would want to be utilizing chronic daily benzos, but PRN sparing use of low dose, no more than say three times a week, can be very beneficial to give a woman some control over the anxiety symptoms that she may be experiencing. Gabapentin is another medication that's been utilized increasingly for anxiety. Unfortunately, most of the data has been specific to the first trimester of pregnancy. Um, it has not demonstrated an increased risk of major malformations with the data that we do have now, but we have very little data with second and third trimester exposure and no data regarding neurocognitive outcomes or development. So just a quick overview of sleep aids. Um, I did not talk about non-pharmacologic management of sleep aids other than just kind of sleep hygiene, but that's certainly where we should always start. It always surprises me the number of postpartum women that are on their phones in the month of the night while they're breastfeeding their babies. Um, so that's something to consider. CBT for insomnia um, can be incredibly useful. And if you've got a woman who's been on long-term sleep medication who's now pregnant, a referral for CBT and for insomnia during her pregnancy may be very worthwhile given that um, she's not gonna be able to utilize a lot of sedating medications in that postpartum period. So kind of getting a handle on that sleep piece is very beneficial. Over-the-counter sleep medications like diphenhydramine, um, Unisom, so Benadryl or Unisom, Tylenol PM, um, certainly they've got the best safety. So if we're reaching for a pill, we should start there. Um, sparing use of benzodiazepines and zolpidem um, is something that we could utilize, again, no more than two to three times per week. So really, truly PR and use. Mirtazapine we discussed. We did not discuss the uh, sedating tricyclic antidepressants, but that may be another option for women who need nightly medications for sleep. 
We have very limited data with trazodone. We have emerging evidence with melatonin that it might be actually quite helpful for preterm labor and IUGR, um, but not enough data to support use in pregnancy, at least at this point. Again, I think that data is emerging and might be changing here in the next few years once we get a little bit more. So just overview of some clinical pearls um, for psychopharmacology, I really want you to focus on functioning for these patients. So how are they functioning day in and day out? If they, it's affecting their ability to function through either depression or anxiety symptoms, treatment is appropriate. So whether that's treatment with a medication or therapy or both, really having a, a good discussion about self-care and what they can do, therapy referral and medication options and kind of giving them an a la carte option of what to choose to help their symptoms. Obviously, um, if they've been on a medication in the past, we always try to return to what the most effective medication in the past has been, rather than using this as a time to try new medications. Monotherapy is always preferred. Um, and we should be utilizing the lowest effective dose of a medication. And I stress that because if the, the, the most effective dose of a woman, say, Zoloft or Sertraline is 200 milligrams, then give her 200 milligrams because I'd much rather have her on a higher dose of medication, but have her symptoms in remission than have her exposed to both the medication as well as to the symptoms themselves. Um, we did not talk about any medications um, in, in this slide set about um, that require mo fetal monitoring, but if you do have medications that do do that, then, then that's appropriate then as well. Document everything, documentation. Um, so you know, what the stability risk, what your non-pharmacologic and treatment options are, what educational resources you provided to the patient, check the PDMP, pick up the phone, discuss and collaborate with, with whoever else is helping to care for this patient. And then the Periscope Project is really here to support you. Um, so this is, again, um, for those of you who have not utilized us, the Periscope Project is a free resource for healthcare providers who are caring for pregnant and postpartum women who are struggling with mental health and substance use disorders. Uh, we provide these three options, a real-time provider-to-provider psychiatric teleconsultation. So phone call back within 30 minutes um, to discuss your patient's case directly with a subspecialty perinatal psychiatrist. I do cover the line about 85 to 90% of the time. So most of the time we'll be talking with you. We do provide educational presentations, such as the one that you just heard, and toolkits on our website, as well as access to community resources specific Perinatal population for women who are struggling with um, mental health or substance use disorders. And here is there, our website is listed here as well as our 1 800 number. If you have questions, concerns, um, want to reach out and have a specific didactic for your, uh, for your clinic or your program uh, or hospital system, Shelby Keen, um, whose email is listed here, can help schedule. I realize I'm running right up to time, but we've got a few minutes and I'm happy to stay on after. So if anybody has any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself. I'd much rather talk to a human being than read a chat box. So thanks to everybody for your attention and, and for attending today. I really appreciate it. Judy, I appreciate that. Anybody else? Um, yeah, this is Shauna Leinbach. I have a question um, talking about the perinatal anxiety and the invasive thoughts. You know, I want to put my baby in the microwave or I'm thinking about stabbing them. How do you differentiate between invasive thoughts and an action plan like you do with suicide? worried if a patient said, I'm thinking about putting my baby in the microwave. So ask her how she feels when she has that thought. And it's usually, and so it's that distress and then just asking specifically about um, any intention. So if a patient were to tell me, I've had thoughts about stabbing my baby, I'm like, well, how does that make you feel? She said, that, that terrifies me. So for intrusive thoughts of an anxiety disorder, that's really terrifying um, and very distressing. And, and, and then I asked, do you have any intention of, of asking those thoughts? Oh my gosh, no, I put the knives away. I, I don't go into the kitchen with my baby because I'm afraid that I'll think about those things. And so that's very different from 
thoughts of, of true harm, particularly those of a psychotic disorder, because those women who have a psychotic disorder, they don't have that rational thought, they, the, the rational piece is gone. Um, so that would be, that's a, a huge difference with that piece is that they, they don't recognize that those thoughts should be distressing to them or those thoughts are quote unquote wrong. Does that, does that help? Yeah, yes, thank you. You're welcome. Again, I thank everybody for attending today. And uh, kind of based on some of the feedback, if you have any specific feedback for myself, um, please don't hesitate to email us or to Shelby directly. Um, we'd love to consider putting these on these types of webinars on on a regular basis going forward. So if you have any ideas about other topics, I'd be happy to do entertain those as well. So thank you, everybody. And we can send out the slides um, afterwards to everyone who attended. We did thank you, Beth, for asking that question, as well as we did record today's session. So we can send that out to anyone or your colleagues who are unable to attend today. Thank you again. Thanks, Shelby. Thank you, everyone. Have a great afternoon and good weekend.